I'm Sergeant Major Stan Bishop, your host for this issue of The Big Picture. Someone once said that there was nothing so rare as a day in June. What does it mean for most Americans? Well, a day in June can mean relaxing at the beach or going for a drive in the country, or perhaps just showing Junior how to bait a hook for the big one that always gets away. I guess you can say, those are things we all like to do. They are a part of our heritage, part of the simple pleasures we enjoy as free citizens of a free country. But for some Americans, a day in June holds different connotations. Take this June, for example. A park is dedicated in Chicago to the memory of PFC Milton L. Olive III, a young soldier from this city who was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for bravery in South Vietnam. Olive's parents, along with local and national dignitaries, Lieutenant General J.H. Michaelis, commanding General Fifth Army, are on the reviewing stand. Mayor Daly speaks for the people of Chicago as he pays tribute to the city's courageous son. Army Secretary Stanley R. Reeser recalls Olive's supreme sacrifice in throwing himself on a grenade to save the lives of his comrades. Later, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Robert C. Weaver remarks, Olive died in young manhood so that his people and the people of a frail nation could live in peace. Mr. and Mrs. Olive prepare to unveil a plaque commemorating their son's act of bravery in Vietnam. PFC Olive's citation reads, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his own life above and beyond the call of duty. In contrast to the solemn ceremonies of a Chicago Park dedication are the competitions held each year on the campus of the University of Illinois. 65 college and university drill teams compete in the annual Illinois Invitational Drill Meet. Started in 1949, the competition invokes a friendly but keen rivalry among the participating ROTC students. The meet opens with a demonstration by members of the famous Fort Myers, Virginia ceremonial drill team. Off the exhibition floor, their military duties include providing presidential honor guards and sentinels for the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington. Next, the Akron University drill team demonstrates a dazzling manual of arms. Not to be outdone, the University of Illinois fields its own crack drill team. Army's Special Forces Green Beret team displays their skilled assortment of judo techniques. Group coordination by co-eds at Kentucky University proves that not only men take honors for a precision drill performed under the pressure of competition. <laughs> DePaul University follows. Their extended drill formations put them in a class of their own.
from Wichita State, complex drills performed with fine originality. personal drill style is that offered by a comedy team from the University of Wisconsin. Experienced officers and sergeants from the armed services act as judges for the competition. Deciding which teams get the trophies may be one of the toughest decisions of their career. Win or lose, all participants will take home exciting memories of this year's Kentucky Derby of drill competition. Also during June, the 320th Artillery, 82nd Airborne Division is going home after seven months as a part of the Inter-American Police Force. Before dawn, a convoy moves out of Camp Coleman near Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. En route to its embarkation point, the convoy crosses the Duarte Bridge, which the rebels barricaded during the fighting. By sunrise, the convoy passes modern but shell-riddled buildings, mute reminders of the battles which had raged here only months ago. Then a short period of waiting at the ocean's edge. On schedule, an LST, the Waldo County, starts to take on this contingent of the 320th for return to Sunny Point, North Carolina. Other elements of the unit are returning by air. Good planning plus coordination among the services speeds the men and equipment toward home. The boarding continues smoothly. Each freshly painted vehicle moves into line in careful loading sequence, then as directed to its position. Next, forklift trucks load the crated supplies and equipment into their designated places. After local elections, the Organization of American States has voted to disband the Inter-American Police Force, and the 320th is the first unit to leave the Dominican Republic. Speaking through an interpreter, Brazilian General Alvaro Braja, Commander-in-Chief of the Inter-American Police Force, thanks the men for their part in helping to keep the peace in a strife-torn country. Then the Waldo County gets underway for the four-day trip back home. While the first convoy is moving out to sea, Another section of the 320th has arrived at nearby San Isidro Airport. General Braha is again on hand, participating in a brief ceremony commending the troops on a job well done. Then the men move to the waiting C-130. Brigadier General Robert Linville, Commanding General, U.S. Forces, Dominican Republic, congratulates his men on the success of their mission. Farewells are said all around as the planes are boarded, and with equipment and luggage loaded, it's goodbye Dominican Republic, hello home.
Halfway around the world, in Heidelberg, Germany, members of the British Royal Fusiliers perform in honor of Queen Elizabeth II. Each year, a Saturday in June is chosen for the Queen's official birthday ceremonies and awards. The ceremony is reviewed by U.S. General Andrew P. O'Mara, Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Army Europe. Also present is Colonel C. Douglas M. Peel, Senior British Liaison Officer to United States Army Europe. The Fusiliers are named for military units, which centuries ago carried a light flintlock musket called a fusil. Their elaborate drill figures are examples of the historic pageantry for which British formal occasions are famous. At the conclusion, General O'Mara thanks Bandmaster Hicks and Drum Major Piper and offers his congratulations for their excellent performance on this festive day. Festivities and solemn dedications. These are examples of what a day in June can mean to some Americans. To the American soldier, these occasions hold deep and significant meaning for they exemplify the traditions and sacrifices inherent in the military services. These principles can take on fresh and revealing meanings in a country such as Thailand, where, in the village of Setun, a quiet war is being waged against one of man's most deadly enemies, malaria. Armed with microscopes and medicines, this team from the Seto Medical Laboratory visits a Thai Department of Welfare land settlement. Their mission is to report any evidence of malarial infection. The team's attention is focused on the children of the community. A captain in the United States Army Medical Corps heads the temporary clinic set up outside of a settlement school. Within minutes, the clinic is operational. Physical examinations are given, and drugs are administered in limited treatment. The team received full cooperation from the younger members of the community. When the first CETO team arrived here in January of 1965, it found that approximately 45% of the children tested had contracted malaria. As a result, the Thai government undertook an intensive campaign to control the disease. A hotel in Satun serves as the local headquarters for the CETO project. On its second floor, a laboratory has been established. The team's findings will be compiled into reports which will be sent to the Thai Ministry of Health and to local government officials. This invaluable information will be used in planning the continuing battle against the ancient and still dangerous problem of malaria. The United States Army, in cooperation with other services, is waging a war against disease and hunger which extends to many corners of Southeast Asia. In the Saigon area, a six-man medical team of the 173rd Airborne Brigade enters the small village of Ba Ria, cleared of Viet Cong only a few hours previously. Medical and dental examinations are the first priority. Within a space of two days, this medical team will treat as many as 400 villagers. It has been said that the best assurance of our friendship is a U.S. Army medic treating a small child in a remote village in Southeast Asia. This medical team leaves behind not only drugs and foodstuffs, but friendships of incalculable value. 
In the central highlands of Vietnam, the search for Viet Cong carries units of the 1st Cavalry into the wilderness of the high country, the traditional home of the fiercely independent Montagnard tribesmen. A steep ravine is spanned by this crude vine bridge. The crossing is made man by man at spaced intervals. Deep in Viet Cong controlled country, the troops come to an area of abandoned rice farms. As the search continues, the air cavalrymen encounter a group of Montagnard farmers. One man says that the VC are frequently in the area. The Arvin lieutenant with the intelligence team learns that they are holding a Montagnard village a few kilometers to the west and that the villagers there are reported in poor condition. The cavalrymen move out to establish a landing zone. Their plan is to airlift forward to the enemy held village, then summon in supplies and needed medical personnel. Meanwhile, at Play Coup, choppers are loaded with men and supplies. They will be transported to the distant reaches of Pleiku province. A weedy overgrown field is selected as the landing zone. While security platoons patrol the surrounding area, smoke markers are ignited as a signal to bring in the helicopters. By now, Mortar crews have set up their weapons and are lobbing shells at the Viet Cong who have laid down a heavy mortar barrage. Suddenly, the cavalrymen learn that the Viet Cong have abandoned the village and fled into the jungle through a maze of underground tunnels. Reaching the village at last, the 1st Cavalry Troopers quickly round up the mountain yards and immediately begin administering medical aid to the undernourished and disease-ridden residents. The Viet Cong have held these people in literal enslavement. With the rescue of the mountain yards, another confrontation with the enemy is successfully concluded. At the same time, badly needed medical aid is given to those who have suffered oppression under the Viet Cong. For those engaged in a not-so-quiet war, June can mean the kind of hard, tough fighting that characterizes the conflict in Vietnam. It is a rescue mission of another sort, involving the kind of skill and training for which the American soldier is renowned. Also in the highlands of South Vietnam, during Operation Hawthorne, Engineers of the 101st Airborne erect a bridge to assist a beleaguered Special Forces garrison that has been under constant attack by the Viet Cong for more than two weeks. An artillery position is established north of Pleiku. From here, combat troops of the 101st Airborne move forward to the aid of the Green Berets. One oh five millimeter howitzers fire in support of the advancing troops. The barrage comes to a halt as Viet Cong mortars score direct hits on our emplacements. The infantrymen encounter heavy enemy automatic weapons and small arms fire. There is an estimated battalion of Viet Cong hidden in the surrounding jungle. The rate of enemy fire increases. The 
battle rages as Viet Cong attack our positions along the entire perimeter. The airborne soldiers hit back with a solid wall of small arms fire. Soon, a mass enemy withdrawal is reported. Point-blank artillery fire harasses them as they retreat. The Screaming Eagles of the 101st Airborne begin their counterattack. At close quarters, hand grenades are hurled to beat off a wave of fanatic Viet Cong. Then everywhere along the perimeter, sky troopers lunge forward. falls back as our combat-hardened troops continue their pursuit. Wounded are brought in while the artillery continues its supporting fire. After the battle, the damage to our equipment is surveyed and reported as minimal. During their disorganized retreat, the Viet Cong lost great numbers of men, weapons, and equipment. This victory of the 101st Airborne over the Viet Cong will not soon be forgotten by either side. Ten days after the battles, Premier Wen Cao Ki visits the 101st Forward Base Camp at Dok To. Accompanied by Brigadier General Willard Pearson, Commanding General of the 1st Brigade, the Premier and his party of Vietnamese government dignitaries are shown some of the enemy weapons and supplies captured by the brigade since the beginning of Operation Hawthorne. The fundamental purpose of Premier Key's visit is to award Vietnamese decorations to General Pearson and other fighting men of the 101st. A group of North Vietnamese army prisoners are in the area. Brigade representatives inform the Prime Minister of the circumstances leading to the capture of these men. Finally, the Premier's visit is concluded and he bids farewell to General Pearson and his staff. Elsewhere in the province of Kontum, the business of fighting the enemy goes on. This hilltop, scarred by 750-pound bomb craters, is a CP for one unit of the 101st. At this isolated forward location, resupply by helicopter is a daily necessity. and the men are well stocked with whatever is needed. Before beginning another search and destroy sweep, Protestant services are conducted in one of the craters. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. After the service, these men will again begin the job of war somewhere in Vietnam. 
A day in June can mean many things to many people. But to American servicemen, it means commitments and self-sacrifice and a continual rededication to the principles that have made America a symbol of freedom and strength to men of goodwill throughout the world. Now, this is Sergeant Major Stan Bishop bringing to a close this issue of your Army Reports.